Uh, yeah, currently work for a company uh, called Romini Street, and they do enterprise support. And you know, when I first joined them um, some time ago, with almost five years, but even prior to that, uh, working in the IT space, so as a program manager and you know your typical program project manager, um, a lot of what I was working on with clients, for etc., was was always remote. So. When I joined um, Romini Street, they um, their model has been remote for 15 years since they started, since their inception. Um, so I thought, well, this will be easy. You know, I've, I've done this before, but I'd always done a hybrid. So it was actually really interesting working for them and um, uh, and going through the experience of actually doing product delivery globally, remotely. Um, and, you know, not only that, we decided early on um, around about four years ago that we would transition our product delivery to, to an agile way of working. So we then had to transform um, our product delivery teams to agile, working in agile um, and all done remotely. So um, it certainly has had its challenges. And, and um, I guess what I'm excited to talk about today is some of the experiences that we've been through, you know, sort of the challenges, successes, um, you know, some things to continue, you know, improving the way that we do in terms of motivating um, our, our team. So, um, so hopefully I can offer something um, new to some of you, some new insights into how we, uh, you know, it was tough at the start, it really was, um, um, more the agile transformation side of things. But, you know, because we were set up already with, with um, I guess, the infrastructure, it made it a little bit easier. So what I'll talk um, a little bit about that. So, okay, so I've got it. So some of the things, I guess that one of the, the topics I wanted to, to sort of raise was about preparation um, for, you know, working with your teams, um, you know, with stakeholders. And in our case, because we're a, um, a, a support, enterprise support company servicing clients, um, you know, we decided um, a number of years ago, as I mentioned before, that we would transition to uh, do all our delivery our software delivery in uh, an agile environment. So um, for us um, internally, some of the, uh, if, I, if I look at some of the things that, you know, helped us actually uh, do that preparation, because our company, as I mentioned, uh, have been agile, have been, sorry, remote um, based, predominantly remote based, I'd say 80%. Uh, we do have sort of labs and offices in some of the larger cities where we actually have to by law um, uh, we've got, you know, we've got to have an office because our company is global. Um, we had the infrastructure already set up, so we didn't have to worry about, um, you know, setting up, um, you know, your VPN access and, you know, safety and all that sort of thing, you know, uh, uh, teams and, and all that. So we already had that in place, so we actually didn't need to um, need to worry about that. So, you know, obviously when we went through, um, you know, we've all been going through the last you know 18 months almost two years of, of the global pandemic um we it wasn't a big change for us really other than the offices that um, had people going in so um so one of the things um with regards to the preparation of our team so i'm going to talk mainly in the agile context so how how did we work successfully because it was it was tough at the start um because we've had people in our groups who were seasoned um, you know, business analysts and developers that were really comfortable in doing what they were doing. Um, so we had to really take them along and hold their hand and through what we were trying to do. So what we found we needed to do was actually be really clear about expectations and roles and responsibilities. Um, because one of the things, um, and, and I personally found was when I started learning about working uh, in this way is okay, well, it says that I don't have a function and or I don't have, I'm more part of a development team. What does that mean exactly? So we had to kind of transition everyone, not just um, say, well, this is your new role and this is what you're doing and here's a job description and what it means. That was never going to work. And I doubt that approach would work in many organisations. So we set clear expectations about what we um, what we were wanting them to transition to and how we would do it and we would do it together. Um, we had to um, set some boundaries within the team and by that I mean um, we really had to push them to think about, you know, not asking them to do more work by having to meet more regularly um, with, their, with their colleagues because a lot of what, you know, we were working in waterfall and a lot of what we did was all about that traditional, you know, 
you know, months um, phases that you go through. So we had to set um, boundaries in terms of more to do with people's time and availability. Um, so because we're a global company and we, for example, I looked after the Asia Pacific region. So we had, we still had various time zones that, um, you know, working with our colleagues in India and Malaysia and Singapore and New Zealand and Australia, et cetera. So we had to say to them, look, it's okay. We understand everyone has their own time zone. We're going to work as best we can in that time zone. And we would take turns to have someone take the, um, a, like a rotation of the, you know, the, the, the nighttime slot or, or whatever it might be, or the, you know, it might be a seven o'clock start for one and you do it every fortnight. So there was, we had to put that in place in order to, you know, put some sort of fairness around this. Um, we also ensured that we um, had budgeted for and gained um, acceptance and approval, I guess, for everyone in our group to be trained in agile practices. So formally trained as a certified scrum master or as a product owner, um, because we tried to kind of find shortcuts and um, to quickly ramp them up. It just wasn't going to work. Um, and what we wanted to do was show that the organisation was committed to actually the transition by providing them with all the training they needed. So we ended up um, training, um, it would have been close to about 220 of our um, product delivery team globally on, um, on as certified Scrum Masters. And um, it's been great. So that's actually a standard thing. As soon as you join, um, you know, you're trained. And, you, and what I've even gone one step further is actually um, not um, really put anyone on a project unless they are trained in some way, even if they've had um, so a, a short training session. Because what we found, um, and this is part of the challenge I'll explain, is that um, we're setting them up for failure. Um, they're going into a project, a developer, for example, and they have no idea about how we're working, the tools we're using, the, the um, I guess the, the description of the meetings and the artifacts and what's a scrum, what, what is a scrum, what is a, what is a sprint. So we made sure everyone was trained to some degree. Um, the other thing, uh, just continuing on from that, is about um, the senior stakeholder engagement. So we made sure that um, we got the buy-in from all our leaders in the organisation because it had flow-on effects for our clients as well and advantages for them being able to turn around our, our releases. So by getting that early upfront um, approval, and it did take some time, it wasn't something we were able to do in a month, it took six months to get um, approval of everyone, for everyone to do the training. So we had to sell the benefits and the advantages for the business. So, um, and now we have other parts of the business unrelated to product delivery and they all work in Agile. So that sort of says something about the investment that we, we made and the, the time we put in. Um, the other thing that we had to prepare for is that we encourage everyone to try to use the video option when we're on calls. So because we've been working in, in as, as a remote company for so long, people get a bit complacent. And I'm sure there's plenty of, I'm sure there's people on this call who feel the same way. And, and we all have our days where we're just not, we're not set up, we're not equipped. We, we haven't had our hair done or look presentable for that video option. But we try to actually um, encourage that for all the, the meetings, the, the scrum ceremonies that we have so that it just feels a lot more personable, particularly in the last 12, uh, the 12 to 18 months. Um, so actually one of the interesting things was we never used to do our videos until last year. We never used to have the video option, but we found as a company, all our colleagues all around the world were going through various stages. Um, a gentleman before from England was talking about, um, you know, having gone through different stages. Well, we were experiencing highs and lows in our team. So being on video helped us to personalise who we were talking to. These are our colleagues. Um, we also made sure people made a point of diarising breaks in their day. So if someone was at lunch, we wouldn't try to pull them off lunch to come into a meeting. We'd make sure that we set, set it all up beforehand so we have our meetings um, and we'd let the people, look, some people wanted to go, needed to go for a run uh, in the afternoon. So that's fine. You need to do that. You make that time for that um, break, that whether it be exercise or, uh, or a lunch break or um, a tea break. So that is really crucial um, because this is not about just because you're working remote, it's not about, you know, giving 24-7 of your time. 
um, to a company. So, and we had that support from our organisation, which was really good. Um, and the other thing is uh, we had to learn to be patient during the Agile transformation. It was very frustrating at the start because we had some really good people leave because it, um, working in this way didn't suit their personality or didn't suit the way they wanted to work. Um, and others took a bit longer to understand. So the ones that were committed but took a bit longer, um, you know, we had, to, we had to give them that time. So um, externally, um, I'll just touch on this briefly. So we um, had to prepare our clients um, because and the reason we, we did that, there were some clear benefits for them. We were actually able to deliver much more quickly. Um, you know, we don't waste time because of working remotely on the whole commute. Um, we never have. So we would start quite early and um, have a break in the day if we needed it and finish later. So we were able to work in with um, clients' timeframes and their time zones as well um, by being flexible. Um, and we also were able to, um, by engaging with them up front with our clients, we were able to involve them in, um, you know, a product backlog a refinement, for example, or any sprint reviews where we thought it was, um, where it was possible um, and appropriate. Uh, wasn't always um, possible, but we tried to do that where we could. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we tried to also prepare our clients and um, by using, you know, we use business social platforms a fair bit, particularly LinkedIn, to share what we've discovered, our transitions, that type of thing. So, um, so this whole preparation stage is ongoing. We're always doing that with all new, new people that come on board and um, uh, new clients that come on board. So I just want to take a, a, a couple of seconds there. Are there any questions about, about this particular topic around preparation? Happy to take any questions. Uh, I've got a quick one about the training. You sure. said that you did Scrum Master training for was that was that for just the Scrum Masters or was that for everyone? That's everybody, yeah, yeah. Because we didn't know, we had some Scrum Masters, but we hadn't actually built up our team of Scrum Masters at that stage. So we had people actually in the team acting as Scrum Masters as well as a product owner, for example, which is not ideal. But um, as you know, we we all don't have limitless um, uh, budgets, so. We had to, we trained everyone as a Scrum Master as a starting point, yeah. And that proved to be effective, at least for, for an introduction. All right, thanks. Sure. So, Alison, uh, on your internal slides, you, you mentioned about the buy-in with stakeholders. And if I, if I remember correctly, it was about six months. Can you talk through that journey on how that was at the start versus towards the end? Sure, sure, Derek. So uh, it was challenging uh, at the start. Um, I was very fortunate to have a very supportive manager who drove a lot of the initiative to move to, uh, to Agile. So he consulted with us and trying to think of a way where we can deliver quickly and scale as a company. Um, so we had to, it was tough. We didn't get approval at the start at all. Um, we had to kind of do it on a... Um, a smaller scale, so pick um, a couple of countries and a, a one small region to work um, to work on it and prove it first. And then once we proved it, and people actually, our teams were enjoying it, at least enjoying to learning. We then presented that to some of our senior stakeholders um, and said, "Well, this is where we are now. This is where what we're doing now." And this we call, we didn't call it a pilot, but I guess you could call it a pilot. Um, and then um, they said, okay, well, why don't we try it region by region? And that's how we ended up rolling it out. So, um, so yeah, that did, did take six months and uh, as it, it did have its challenges. And, but what I could see is actually um, we use teams a lot for, you know, celebrating successes and things like that. I see all that coming up in teams a lot now saying, oh, we work, we work in agile. These are other groups within the business. So we then started educating other parts of the business about what we were doing. They found out that we were having success with what we were doing. So they started um, other groups. So for example, you know, professional services who do custom work for clients, they started working in that way. Um, and then, um, so we talk that language now um, and three years on um, having been through this, it's, it's really, it's satisfying to see that that's how far we've come. Uh, you know, because the biggest challenge for us was not just the stakeholders, senior stakeholders engaging, 
in what we wanted to do. It was actually our people. Um, you know, these are seasoned professionals that have 20 plus years each on working on enterprise systems in Waterfall. It's very hard to change that <laughs> way of working when they've been successful. So I think our, our teams was our biggest challenge. So, but we did it. Yeah. Um, one of the um, the other big things I uh, Roman talked before about some time that I spent in Japan. So I worked in Japan um, from about May 2019 and through COVID as well, and returned back to Australia in December last year. And the reason I went over there was trying to actually help them transition um, as well. And um, it was really difficult. And I worked in the Asian region uh, in a number of countries for many years uh, with other companies as well. And uh, for those that have been exposed to um, working in other countries, particularly in the Asia Pacific region, it's all about relationships. Um, and it was very difficult trying to do that remotely. So we were trying to transition them remotely. And, and that's why I went over there to help them um, to, to, work, to work in this way, um, to look for some efficiencies and, and help them transition across. So it was really tough because uh, I started off in the office in Japan and then had to transition back to working from home and so did the entire Japan team. Uh, so it probably took six months longer than what I would have liked. Um, but, um, you know, I check in with them all the time now and they have a scrum master. They only work in agile, but, but we had some real serious roadblocks there in terms of people accepting the way that we work. Um, the people were amazing that I work with, but just really struggled with the whole concept about, um, you know, different roles, working as a team, um, and, you know, working through this, they thought it was, God, oh, it's such a long process to go through these user stories, but when we sat down and worked through it, um, you know, really slowly, we, we took our time doing it because we needed to. Um, language was also an issue uh, because predominantly most of them speak uh, Japanese and I don't speak Japanese, um, but not to the level I, that they do. Uh, we happened to hire someone who was bilingual and he was fantastic. He was a developer, but we actually ended up making him a scrum master because he was fantastic um, at the communication and was keen to do that. So we just had to think on the fly a lot of the time and work this out as we went. Um, yeah, so a few challenges there along the way. Definitely. Um, Alison, uh, I think Giselle has a, a okay. yeah. question. Sure, yes, so. yes, thank you, Derek. Um, Alison, how any tips to bring in your clients and also your project managers into this journey? Because in my experience, it's a lot easier or not easier, but what normally happens is that IT comes into the journey uh, and everybody else doesn't. Um, so yeah. you create these agile bubbles and it is really hard to get the client into, into the agile mindset and also project managers push for delivery on their yeah. waterfall timelines and and we have this little bubble inside that it, it's it's really hard for for the people inside yeah that is 100 percent agree with you giselle and um i think you know if we talk about um on the client side we were really selective uh let me actually let me take a step back when we started working in agile we thought we'll bring the clients in they can help us with the backlog and we can make sure we're delivering a quality product that was an absolute disaster for us because they thought it was a wish list for everything <laughs> that they wanted and they got a bit too overexcited. We weren't ready for that. So we then pulled that right back and um, then looked for what we called, um, well, we internally call it a friendly client, but it was more around saying, okay, who do we um, want to engage with that um, has a very simple setup? Um, let's not try to bring um, someone in that's got maybe some you know, complex scenarios. So we tried to keep it really simple and we're very selective about who we, which clients we bring in when we're doing work. Uh, and we, we let them know up front, it's not about a, an open wish list. It's about looking at, okay, because in our, in my group, what it was, we, we do legislative updates. So it's not about customizing that. We just take whatever legislation and make those changes for our clients. So um, there wasn't a lot of room for them to customize anything to what they wanted, but we wanted, to, um, we wanted to engage with them just to test what we were doing and to see, okay, is there a better way to do it? Maybe there's some insights that they can give us as well. And the sprint reviews were great because we were able to demo. Uh, I know everyone hates using demo with Agile, but we were able to at least give them an insight as to what we were building uh, you know, throughout that process. So we wouldn't invite them 
to every sprint review. We would um, engage with them um, probably every second or third. Um, and we, we still only do it selectively and it depends what we're working on. Um, on the project manager side, we don't really, um, we don't actually have project managers. Um, we have program managers. Um, you know, my team, I have a program manager who looks after larger programs of work. Um, and what she does is she looks after all the other non-development type work. Um, so there might be, you know, uh, engagement with third parties or with government authorities or, you know, talking to clients about what we're doing. So we don't have that issue, but I, I do know um, um, from speaking with others, it is tough um, engaging, not, not the project managers themselves, but them getting an understanding of how that fits it's because that whole combination of waterfall and agile together, it can work, but it's very, it can be quite difficult to make that work at times. Um, so I often say um, to me, it's about, I think often the project manager, they don't have an agile background. And if they don't, um, it's it's always a good idea to, to educate them a little bit about that so that they understand what you're talking about when you're working through those different ceremonies and the artifacts, et cetera. So, and bring them along as much as possible without inundating them with every single daily scrum, every single scrum planning event, backlog refinement, et cetera. So give them enough so they understand what's going on. Um, but that combination, it is, it's always going to be a bit challenging. Um, I think it's achievable, but we, we tend not to use project managers. We, we focus on our scrum masters and empowering our team. So don't, we don't specifically have that issue. Thank you, Alison. No problem. Um, okay, so I might just jump. How are we going for time, Derek? <laughs> I'm uh, about, keeping it uh, up. No, all good. Uh, about oh, okay. Six oh four. So uh, okay. another another ten more minutes, if you if you like. Yeah. Okay. So some of these um, points I've talked about um, in the previous slide, but just to highlight some of the challenges that we had. So being a global company, we have multiple time zones. So even though we tend to focus our groups in, um, in the one region, so we're still in various time zones by country. Um, you know, it's, we're a US company, so you know, we have um, all different time zones that we're dealing with all the time. So um, that made it easier working remote because we, we didn't have commute issues with trying to, to get to the office, then dial in. We dialed in um, when we could. But what I did notice when I first started, with, and it, it kind of got, it did get better, was um, when I first started, there was a lot of these early morning 5 a.m., 6 a.m. meetings and late into the night. And um, I think what I enjoyed doing and working through was the challenges of that, particularly in the last two years, um, because people got exhausted, right? We were going through some really trying times around the, around the world. And um, it, it softened the way that we um, had our meetings. So, um, so on top of learning and, and constantly going through that agile journey and delivering in agile, you know, working in multiple time zones and going through a global pandemic, you know, pandemic, it, it's that's massive challenges. No one expected that, that in amongst everything. So, um, so that was tough uh, working through that. Uh, we also have a variety of cultures, um, you know, that we work with, um, just even in our region. And it was about actually, um, you know, working and understanding and showing respect for the cultures that we have. And that was really important. And that's something that our company um, and, you know, myself are really big on. Um, you know, so everyone learns in a different way. And, you know, we've got lots of accents, which makes for a really interesting company. Um, you know, and, and just being respectful, you know, people have their, you know, their holidays, their cultural holidays, religious holidays. So, you know, being respectful of that. Um, and when, you know, people need to take time off, yeah, that's fine. We'll work around it. We always did because we knew that when they came back, they would work right, right through to get the job done. So it's dealing with that culture in the right way or the, those differences. Um, the time criticality of projects. So because of the work we did, um, you know, we're, we're meeting, um, we're doing delivery of our legislative updates. So it's all about, it's all time critical. So there might be a piece of legislation due for clients um, on the 1st of July, and we only know about it a month before. So we don't have any time. So, you know, to, to be able to transform the way we work, work in agile and, and learn along the way as well as deliver. So, and that's a constant challenge we have all the time. So we just, um, 
that's why we always take the time out uh, when we need it. Um, so we always, you know, allow people to take time um, to, I guess, recover um, and to, to rest. Um, the other thing is agile may not always suit the project. And, and I, I think not just even for us, just in the other conversations I've had, um, just in my own network, um, you know, there are some projects and even some of the, some of the bigger programs that we rolled out, um, it's so easy to just slip back into a different way of working because everyone knows it. And, you know, we don't have to bring someone up to speed if we're onboarding a new person, they already know waterfall. So let's just go waterfall and do it that way. But we fought that really hard to, to just stick to, to what we believed in and keep going with it and, um, and educating each other about it and making it fun along the way. So I'll talk about team motivation and, and stuff like that in a minute. Um, but, you know, quite often even um, some of my colleagues said, it's just so much easier if we just, it's a lot easier to just go with waterfall. And I said, we can't break back into that because uh, we've come so far uh, with where we are. So let's just keep going. We'll be able to do it. And we did. Um, uh, the other issue challenge that we have, and I'm sure people can relate to this one, is the lack of people. Um, and it's particularly for us, it's on the Scrum Masters. So our company is still learning um, that, you know, you know, we might have 30 or 40 um, uh, projects on at any one time in one region. Uh, we don't have 30 um, or even half of that Scrum Masters. Um, so, and it's not always about the Scrum Master. Sometimes we have smaller ones. So it's smaller projects that, you know, we can actually manage that. But it's that whole balance, um, I think, of where you need them and where you don't. Um, and, you know, it's always going to be a challenge. Every, all organisations don't have, you know, um, endless budgets. So we've had to find ways to work around that and, and skill people up and empower them to, you know, they're trained it as a Scrum Master, you know, take the challenge and, um, and, and try your hand at it. And we had plenty of support from others to sort of jump in if need be. Um, and I don't think I need to go into the, the pandemic challenge either. So I'm going to skip that one, but that uh, obviously added its other uh, issues. But I felt more uh, the challenge there in Japan, um, trying to transition them to agile uh, during the pandemic. So that, that was tough. Um, but, you know, again, um, we're dealing with different cultures. Um, it's not going to go away in a hurry and we need to do this. So we, we took our time and did it and we were allowed the time, more importantly, um, to work through that. Yeah. Any questions on, on these challenges? Or is, has there, I guess what I'm kind of interested to know, has anyone got any other challenge that they want to share? I mean, these are the ones that we, that my, myself and the organisation I work for, experience is there any other challenge that people want to offer up um, that they felt you know just either transitioning through agile or just even working remote I'm sure there's lots <laughs> I will share That's one of my biggest challenges Alison Thanks, and Giselle. it's that video um, mm. It's really hard. It has been really hard to encourage the people to use video since um, the pandemic starts. So there are different justifications. So if you're the Scrum Master, you or me as a Scrum Master, I sort of run out of of options and ultimately just give up <laughs> because you cannot yeah. push the people, even though you can sell uh, all the benefits of seeing each other. They will always yeah. have excuses, and it, yeah. it does affect the collaboration. Especially if you don't totally have agree. many tools. Uh, currently, I have a company that definitely does is not um, set up mm. for this. So there's no collaboration tools, and people don't want the video on. So I'm I'm always on the screen yeah. by myself, trying to mm. encourage the behavior. So I'm not too sure if you have any tips on that or anybody else. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I can offer up to that because we have the same challenge as well, and and it's the sort of thing that you don't want to you know, force people to go on video because you don't know what people's setup is at home either. So, um, you know, what we try to do, um, I know what I do in my team. So I have about 30 uh, business analysts and team leads and product owners. Um, and we have one fortnightly call every, sorry, every, every second Thursday we have a call and it's not about work. It's purely, it's just called a casual catch up, but the only proviso is that we all go in video and, I'd say 95% of the people do go on video just for that one call. And we just, we just, we take turns, people run games and they, we do a quiz or, um, 
and and it's it's that's created a little bit of that um i guess um building that bit of you know um relationship i guess with each other and we're all going through the same thing it's all really tough we're all really busy but but maybe just doing that every now and again rather than trying to encourage them every time because um some people are comfortable with it and and others others aren't and so I find by doing that, that's actually most of them will go on video um, and that they become quite competitive with their quizzes and, um, and games too, I might add. So that's been fun to watch that evolve over time where the, the sort of challenge is a bit competitive about who's, who's running the best game today. And to the point that the other day we had one and we had to sign in with a QR code on our phone to, to join this game. And I thought that was fantastic. So they're really kind of getting into that spirit. So we, tr we try to have a bit of fun along the way um, as much as we can. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Giselle. Hamish had a question. Hamish had a question? Yeah, yeah I was just going to say one of the one of the challenges that, um, that I've faced recently is I started a new job as Scrum Master eight weeks ago and they've only been in the office three days. Mm. Um, and it's such a critical part of the job is building those relationships and when everything's just over video calls, um, it, it certainly makes it uh, much, much harder to build those relationships and develop that trust. Yeah, absolutely. Do, do you go on video all the time? Oh, yeah. For every, yeah. Yep. And yeah that, that does help. I'll just throw out random Zoom calls and just go, hey, I'm sitting in a call. I'm doing work. If you want to come and have a chat, just come and hang out just yeah, to try and foster fantastic. that yeah. you know, sense of, you know, turning around at your desk and having a random conversation with people. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, it's been a curly one. Yeah, yeah, that is that is tough. I think when I joined my current company, they they were all uh, working remote. So they were all used to it. But I And I'd had worked in remote in another company prior to that. But when we were hiring people that have come from an office-based environment, they some really struggled. Yeah. Um, I, and I really like that idea about actually... Um, uh, asking someone to sort of join you on a video call and you kind of work away at your own work while you're um, while you're on video um, because I, I know I, you, you kind of do I've done that on a personal level with family members during the pandemic where we sat, sit for two hours and you know my sons for example would be watching television while I might be cooking or something so why can't that transition to the yeah. workplace I think that's a great idea mm, mm, really nice. like that. that's worked well yeah yeah but video is the key, I think. It does make a difference yeah. when you can't um, see someone. So, Yep, definitely. Yeah. Squeeze one more question from uh, okay. Swapna. Are you there? Um, yeah, hey. Uh, Hi, not a question, but just to add to this conversation from my experience. Um, uh, so in terms of uh, getting people to come on uh, the video on mode, uh, what, what I tried with my teams is we tried having virtual desktop or like a background team because okay. we recognize that team members were hesitant to come on video mm -hmm. because of their remote setting so whatever is the environment that they are in so when we gave them an option of having a remote uh, at, as a virtual team they were so comfortable coming on video because they know that it's the the setup is now hidden from the audience and it just naturally uh, spiked everyone's interest to come to that meeting with a video on mode uh, with a beautiful uh, background to even talk about. So that added to another layer of conversation between the team members uh, and also naturally brought them on video. So that was one thing that um, I wanted That's to great. highlight here. Um, and also adding to uh, Hamish's point about, yeah, joining a new team in a lockdown is, is quite, um, quite yeah. a big challenge. Uh, I underwent the same thing. Uh, so I work for Vodafone here as an agile coach. Okay. Uh, back when I joined them uh, last year as a scrum master, um, I had the same in, uh, scenario. So what I tried is, yes, of course, having the video call is beneficial, uh, but I could sense within the first week or first and a half week is uh, they were struggling to uh, get comfortable with Jira as a tool. So they were very beginning mm. in their agile journey. Uh, so still getting up uh, hands on to the tools. Um, so I set up a session about ask me anything about Jira session. Um, so Fantastic. and then pe people started coming and pop. It was like an open invite and they started yeah. coming in for five, 10 minutes. Um, and around not only did we speak about the Jira, we also spoke about a lot many things. Um, yeah. So that opened up the door of communication with between me and team. Um, yeah. And a huge, um, you know, uh, a mutual respect started building there. 
um and and that works still date for me so yeah yeah just wanted to add that yeah I like this the idea of a drop-in session they're fantastic yeah yeah we, yeah. we try to do that when we can as well so it, it you can't you just have to find ways to be creative um yeah. you know and try it if it doesn't work um yeah it doesn't work then you try something different and I think that's why they, these meetups are really good where you have the opportunity to hear what other people are um are doing so we all don't have the answers but you know I'd, I'd love some of the suggestions that people have um have mentioned on here and I'm, I'm going to steal some of those and use them in my my own meetings um and uh and ceremonies so yeah that's fantastic wonderful all right so i might just keep oh. moving i'm just conscious of sorry derek was that derek you were about uh 18 past six and stuff so um almost time yeah. to yep okay all right i've only got one or two more slides left so let's just So some of the, um, I'll just quickly run through some of the successes, which I've really touched on a, a little bit um, earlier. Um, you know, I think for us, uh, as I mentioned, you know, our company has been working remote for 15 plus years. So all our infrastructure was in place. I think some companies, it would have probably taken them six months to get that set up last year. So um, it's tough. Um, we were very fortunate to be able to not even worry about that. Um, it was more about um, the people that were originally in the offices and having to work remote. Uh, and then obviously the, the stressors around um, the pandemic. Um, we have an internal culture, which you know tends to empower people to just get on with the job. We don't have a lot of bureaucracy um, and we, we can speak up if we need to make improvements. So we, we capitalize that on, on as much as we could coming through Agile. Uh, our agile transformation. So, um, you know, that flowed down all the way through, um, you know, down sideways, upwards. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're lucky to be able to do that. So if you can kind of nurture that to, to happen, it's not always possible, but if you've got the ability to kind of slowly chip away at that, I'd encourage you to, because even just you can get little wins like that through that empowerment of your own team. Um, the other thing, um, we said it's okay to take time off. Um, you know, we, we're a very busy company like most organisations, but if someone needs two days off because they don't have headspace to do something, we would just encourage them to take the day off. They're no, they're no good when you can't focus on something and, you know, um, their health is important. And um, so we encouraged that a lot last year. It was very tough for everyone, so we, we had to. Um, it's not all about work. I, I mentioned before about making time for fun. So we we have team a Teams uh, Microsoft Teams, and we use that. We have various channels on there that we use to celebrate success um, right through the company at a global level, at a regional level, uh, and at a country level as well. So and we've awarded people um, with gift certificates. Um, uh, I think we had a we celebrated. I think it was the 15 year mark uh, anniversary for our company. So we actually did a this was last year <laughs> during the pandemic, we did a 24 hour party globally. And um, Australia, for example, did a cocktail thing and they all had cocktail things sent to them. And Japan did a trip around Tokyo and, and ran a, did a video um, story and, and it just basically, so it, everyone was in, in, uh, um, permitted to join any party that they wanted to, even if it was at 3 a.m. So, you know, fun things like that. I mean, that's a little bit crazy, but, um, but <laughs> it was fun. Uh, it was absolutely fun. And we had, um, we celebrate a lot of that types of success and as well as the virtual lunches, virtual drinks um, as well. So, and I think what's that, that's encouraged us to do is not just, you know, we started a lot more of that last year, but we've maintained it as well. Um, and, you know, we've got, you know, you know, um, our bigger organization doing that as well, right throughout. So, um, the support for Agile um, for all of our global product delivery team uh, being trained. So we were very lucky to be able to do that. Uh, we did have to kind of sell the concept first, but we were able to do that and ended up getting all of our team um, fully trained. Um, and also this respect for people's time and development and growth as well. So keeping all of these things kind of at front of mind um, has allowed us to be successful because we're looking after, you know, uh, people that, that you know we you know we wouldn't couldn't do what we do without them so um you know not booking people's time at, at crazy hours or you know if someone said they couldn't make it it's okay we'll reschedule it so not betting them down because of that 
um, and then allowing them to, to go off and, and do some other things and, um, and work on other projects and work in other areas if they need to. So um, those sort of successes, um, we celebrated that as much as we could. Um, so I hope that's sort of given people a, a few insights um, there, a few crazy ideas to share. <laughs> um, and the last one, uh, just quickly. Yeah, it, it, uh, this is more around team motivation um, and, and how do we manage to, um, after the transition to Agile, um, how do we actually just maintain that hype? As I mentioned before, it's, it's celebrating successes and we always um, do that. And it might just be, it might just be a, a, a team's, um, a shout out on teams. Um, for a team that was fighting a, a bit of a battle with a difficult project and they've, you know, been able to release it to a client on time. Um, um, you know, and we do that through MS Teams. You can do it through Slack, email, whatever works, you know, whatever whatever you have in your organisation. And we shared it with the company, uh, with a wider company, not just within our group. Um, just so that because people often don't know until you you know, share things with them. They don't know the work that you're doing. Um, and, you know, we used to get reactions from our colleagues in South America, in LATAM or in Europe, um, with a pat on the back for our team members. And it, it means a lot to them. Um, so being able to use those tools wherever we could was great. Um, and sharing of Agile and Scrum knowledge. So we, a lot of us do some informal mentoring and coaching. I, I know I, I quite enjoy doing that. Um, uh, within my organisation um, and even outside of that. And a lot of us, we enjoy that. We've, and it's this type of thing as well, being able to share uh, what works, what doesn't, um, maybe considering other options um, for how to be successful. Um, and regular check-ins um, after the transition. So we, we often have these uh, virtual lunches. Um, we have our uh, uh, a senior scrum master in India, for example, who runs a lot of our internal training. Um, and he'll do a, you know, a virtual training session, um, a lunchtime session, uh, we'll have drinks, all that sort of stuff. So doing that regular check-in, um, I still do that with the our Japan team, um, just to make sure that they're still on the right path and, you know, if they have any questions, because they don't often want to reach out, <laughs> but they'll, they'll tell me things if I actually reach out to them. So, um, and uh, yeah, the last point there is about having that regular ongoing formal training. So you, we still encourage our people. We've sent them on to other training as well, um, uh, whether it be product donor, um, um, advanced scrum master, um, that type of training, just to keep that their level of uh, qualification up and also help them um, develop in their, their journey as well. So, so I think that's it from me um, in terms of the formal part. Um, does anyone have any Q&A or if we're running out of time, we can always do Q&A at the end after uh, Rowan's presented. Rowan, I'm not sure what you wanted. I'd just like to have everyone thank Alison. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. And thank you to everyone who asked questions or shared your experience. Uh, that's what this meetup's all about. It's great to have it interactive and yeah, great to have that conversation going. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, if it's okay, maybe we can transition into part two and just get the other part that was advertised, I guess, on the road. Can you see something in the background there? Is that working? Yeah? Yes. <clears throat> All right, I'll give this a go. I've got new technology from some new content here. I'm just going to try to uh, make it a, a short version of what a masterful Scrum Master does. So let's get started. Um, my journey, I guess, goes back to 2003 with the Scrum Master role. I became a Scrum Master in my organization back then. And there was no one I knew in Australia playing the Scrum Master role. No one I knew actually practicing Scrum. And uh, yeah, I had to learn by making all sorts of mistakes. <laughs> I had one book and, and that was the only thing I had to, to figure this out through. So uh, since then, I guess I've been interested to see how the whole role of the Scrum Master has been evolving, how it's been interpreted and misinterpreted. And I've been doing some short talks, I guess, in Sydney, Melbourne, New Zealand, 
And when we look at the results of how relevant are the following challenges for you, and uh, this was to a room full of scrum masters and uh, agile coaches, I guess, the scrum master role, not well enough understood amongst hiring managers and recruiters was number one in Sydney and scrum masters caught up in project administrivia. Uh, so in Melbourne, we had the administrivia a bit lower down, but this scrum master role, not well understood being a big issue for, for a lot of people. And I think that reflects a lot of what I'm hearing from people. I do a lot of training courses, training people as a certified scrum master or the advanced and the certified scrum professional scrum master. And yeah, there seems to be a lot of what I observed too. And as a coach uh, that resembles doing a lot of running events, a lot of people call them ceremonies, but also just doing a lot of other meetings and updating things in JIRA and a lot of things that you would associate with a more administrative role. I'm um, just putting this up to be a bit provocative because there's a few people sort of saying, well, maybe we don't need this sort of thing because Scrum Masters don't seem to be adding a lot of value. And yeah, if you look at what Atlassian have on their website, I'll leave it <laughs> for you to kind of judge this one, but it doesn't fill me with uh, enthusiasm suggesting that Scrum Masters are people to get the team coffee. Yeah, so what does it say in the Scrum Guide? The Scrum Master is accountable for the Scrum team's effectiveness. And the Scrum Master is a true leader uh, who is actually working not just with the Scrum team to boost their effectiveness, but the whole larger organization, really the organization that uh, has anything to do with that Scrum team and perhaps impacts it or what have you. I'll see if I can stand to the side here. <laughs> All right, and really, if you think about effectiveness, if you think about capability, then I'd suggest that's a really, really high leverage thing to, to lead. Uh, and if you think about comparing that with other roles as a project manager or some sort of team lead, uh, especially if it's something a bit more just executing a project or managing in the status quo capability, that's a very different thing from changing the capability, from actually leading change to actually having a number of people actually amplified their effectiveness, not just for one project, not just for one sprint, but as a cumulative benefit to the organization ongoing, and even to work towards some sort of shift that's actually sustainable. And one thing I'd like to pick up on the sustainability is Mike Cohn uh, has talked and written about in his book, Succeeding with Agile, uh, this idea of escape velocity. Like every organization has a organizational gravity. And I think you relate that to a lot of the organizational systems and incentives and the ways people are, uh, uh, been, have been working for a long time, a lot of the things they're conditioned to, to do. And really to actually have it sustainable, we need to actually reach a certain escape velocity and have a certain amount of critical mass to be able to sustain a, a new culture and sustain a new uh, set of systems that support that. So if you think about it, uh, our role as a Scrum Master goes beyond just locally optimizing a set of developers. It goes beyond just being of service to a product owner. It actually goes to the broader organization because that's often where the biggest challenges lie after you've got the basics uh, working. Uh, I might just make this one a bit bigger. <clears throat> this was how it was taught to me when I did the first um, Scrum course in Australia in 2005. Um, yeah, February 2005, overlooking Manly Beach. And uh, the material was straight from Ken Schwaber, one of the inventors of Scrum as we know it. And he said that there's five responsibilities for a Scrum master. And I think this phrasing was really illustrative of how this was intended to be a, a really quite big picture sort of role removing the barriers between development and the customer. So the customer directly drives development. I think the language has cha changed a little later on to say the business, but it really here, essentially you think of it as the person who's paying for the work being done, the sponsor, and really disintermediating between that person who's got that need and that money on the line and saying, how about you exert control by steering directly to get the best value for your money, which is really that second point teaching the customer how to maximize return on investment and meet their objectives through Scrum. 
So straight away, those first two points aren't anything to do with just buying the development team coffee. They're really to do with a change in the whole game that we play in, in the organisation between uh, a business unit or a product manager and, and developers actually uh, responding to, to those needs. And the third one, improving the, the lives, <laughs> the actual lives of the development team by facilitating creativity and empowerment. How many job descriptions have you read with those words in it? I think it'd be lovely to see that on the Scrum Master job descriptions and maybe even Agile coaches might aspire to bring that to work every day. How do we turn up the knobs on creativity and empowerment and improving the productivity in any way possible other than violating sustainable pace, working overtime, et cetera, improving the engineering practices. So I do think that's, if you are to be effective, something to tune into and, and understand where the, the limits are, what does it look like versus the state of the art with some of the agile development practices and be able to have informed conversations about how some of those challenges and weaknesses might be addressed. But uh, at the bottom, it says, uh, not just facilitator. I've done a number of seminars and webinars, things like this, where when we ask what is the interpretation of the Scrum Master in your organization, a lot of people come back saying a team facilitator. And I would say that that's overly constrained, if not wrong, on two different dimensions. One is it's not just facilitator, and the other is it's not just developers. It's not just the team. It actually goes product owner and, and beyond to the broader organization. And yeah, I do have a number of points. I'll put these slides up online uh, so you can read it a bit easier than me just moving around like this. But there's a lot of implications, just of those five points there, that are pretty fundamental shifts in the beliefs and in the, the way the organization functions. And I think that's where a lot of the highest leverage comes from. If you just talk about leverage, it's not just about running some meetings, it's actually some game changes. Uh, if you look at this, uh, yeah, this is just a summary of some of the game changes, I think uh, really relevant. There's, there's more that we could talk about, but um, yeah, there's a lot of real paradigm shifts, if you, if you will, between efficiency to effectiveness, delivering more output rather than playing the game of trying to maximize velocity. I think a lot of teams could do well to actually have tighter feedback loops and better discovery techniques to be able to increase the value with less output and actually have a better read on whether that output's actually being used and whether we're actually uh, hitting the right mark in a moving target situation like we have in a complex environment. Instead of a delivery machine, <laughs> steady state delivery machine, uh, continuous improvement towards a perfection vision. Uh, the question I always ask when I come into any organization as a coach these days is why do you want any organizational change, any agile, what do you want from it? And unless that's clear, we're working in a vacuum of understanding what better looks like. And that's one of the first words in the agile manifesto is we're discovering ways to be yeah, better essentially. Um, but what does better mean? What is that for you? And what's, what's the way that we can actually have alignment towards that better? Uh, yeah, and again, in the Agile Manifesto, it talks about customer collaboration rather than contract negotiation. If you think about a lot of the way things are set up in organizations, it's a lot to do with negotiating what scope is going to be delivered by a certain date and perhaps within a certain budget. And really, there's an, another game to play, which is much more that cooperative game with the person who's got the most interest in that equation actually steering it directly. So yeah, um, there's big shifts there, right? There's things that Scrum Masters can really do to get out of the game of perhaps just focusing on uh, the ideas uh, as things we pr produce into output and letting it at that, right? Just delivering, 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 um, but really having us focus on, on goals, uh, goals that actually are perhaps product metrics from a business perspective, or uh, really thinking about how we can change the lives of our users, our customers, our stakeholders in terms of outcomes. So yeah, this is, this is where we can start to get away from delivering you know, those, those 57 features and instead say, what's our product goal, which is one of the new 
things in the scrum guide to say let's have some clarity on how we would measure the the outcomes and the impacts we have uh, through this not just uh, deliver all the 57 things we thought of at the start but try to deliver the, the minimum amount to actually have the impact that's desired and yeah if you wanted to summarize the scrum master in three words uh the words i would use would be capability improvement leader that's one side there uh so really capability being that high leverage that real big benefit to the team and to the broader organization that we can uh, have a cumulative benefit with over time and it's a leadership role because we're changing the status quo distributed at gemba this is the real place where the value is created and there's a consumption gemba perhaps where people actually use your product or or system uh, and really being embedded there means that we understand and can empathize uh, with the situation that people find themselves in with impediments with struggles with knowledge and with all of the the day-to-day -day challenges that people face and it's quite different from uh, a lot of managers who may not be close enough to the day-to-day -day work they're not pairing with developers or able to to be there to listen to to uh, what's going on in the the daily scrums etc and and not just that there's there's also that safety that comes with not being a line manager or not having uh, performance reviews uh, being done by the, the Scrum Master. And of course, this is embedded inside out change rather than the approach of an agile coach being from outside in and you know, potentially being th be thinly spread across many teams, uh, having Scrum Masters embedded in all teams uh, is quite a different game. And I think one that would actually be preferable and, and more effective in a lot of organizations that have a small number of agile coaches spread thinly. What a Scrum Master does, just to summarize <laughs> in a one slide uh, format, lead adoption of Scrum is one of the first things it talks about in the, the Scrum Guide. Uh, and there's lots of elements to that, right? The, not just the, here's what it is, but why? Why do we have these? these practices, why do we have these events and artifacts? And there's also transparency. So a lot of bringing reality to bear so that people can own their own reactions to it. The developers can react to the situation, the product owner can make better decisions. Um, a lot of what I found in even recovering failing projects and things that were going bad was often just to really turn up the knobs on this and bring transparently the reality of the situation to people who could do something about it rather than me control it or me try to solve it uh, it's really a case of exposing the the relevant information the relevant situation and i've seen uh, well been part of a recovery of a multi-million pound project that was i was told was going to fail very embarrassingly um, just by doing that uh, improving flow so if you think about all the possibilities with teamwork, where there's test-driven workflows, there's being able to start together, uh, to swarm, to pair, to mob. There's there's lots of techniques that I think we can do online. And I've, I've been talking to someone who uh, is on the Advanced Certified Scrum Master course with me tomorrow. He's talking about having a virtual team room with video on constantly. And you know, I've also seen some great things change when we actually have uh, everyone start together and able to they have clarity on what is all the, the acceptance test to pass uh, from day one of working on something in a sprint. Uh, and of course, yeah, instead of doing things for people, it's a case of teaching them to do it themselves. One thing I think is a great test of, of Scrum Masters uh, end result is that uh, your team, a few months in perhaps to starting a Scrum adoption, will get up and do a daily scrum and really find it useful and effective and plan their day and be really coordinated and, and effective that day without the scrum master present um, because you've taught them techniques and habits and, and new patterns to to make that work for them and make it really relevant and they really understand and take to heart that it's actually the developers to actually manage their own progress and their own process scrum masters there to teach them and support them and to challenge them actually in stepping it up and leveling up but not to do it for them uh, in terms of how to operate to do these things to 
establish a healthy agile scrum environment to to improve transparency to manage flow and you know other things you might come across uh, there's a number of stances that i find really useful to not just be aware of but actually skill up in to be effective and be able to move between these stances with personal agility which yeah, is a challenge uh, itself so you can probably see some pretty familiar things here there's a I can find the way to point. It's obviously back, back to front for me. I'm struggling with it. But uh, facilitator, right? There's a facilitator one up there. There's a coach. Uh, of course, that's professional coach, not solving the problem for someone, but unlocking their own ingenuity to come to their own answer. There's a teacher, right? And there's lots of teachable moments when we, when we come across situations where people aren't aware of the, the knowledge, what they, they don't need coaching at that point. In fact, it's inappropriate to use coaching when someone is just lacks the knowledge, lacks the information, lacks the awareness. Um, basically, it's coaching is appropriate where there's a knowing doing gap. There's people know it, but they don't know how to apply that knowledge in their situation in that unique context. Uh, there's impediment removal facilitator. So remember, they can't just remove them on your own when you deliberately don't have the authorities to in the Scrum Master role. There's also servant leadership style I'll touch on again uh, manager to preserve the integrity of the environment and the authorities that we've decided we want to have for the product owner and the developers to keep it a healthy working environment the change agent sparking change keeping change moving fanning the flames uh, keeping that energy up keeping things going uh, and mentor bringing your own expertise being a trusted advisor and something that i think is yeah, really useful with a lot of teams and people who are, you know, just not having the experience, not having the background, not having the confidence perhaps to, to get started on something new. And reflective observer is in there, uh, based on that metaphor of Alistair uh, Coburn, who likes to say the scrum is a mirror, a way to better see where our opportunities for improvement are. And the scrum master is a human, mirror able to bring a perspective that's agile lean scrum based to it in terms of where to spend time this one i've just taken from kenny rubin of kenneth rubin who wrote essential scrum but uh, yeah really i feel it <laughs> is very much along the lines of my experience as a scrum master which was uh, i was more effective if i spent most of my time on impediments and i'm not just talking about day-to-day -day impediments ones that can be resolved within 24 hours i'm talking about campaigns of, of things that are just having a drag effect on the team's progress or the team's success on achieving sprint goals and and beyond that to having a healthier more agile organization that might take weeks or months to to resolve and the sort of things where we need to actually study them understand the root cause different intervention options take a cost of not resolving it to people who have got the authority to resolve it, often managers, I partner up with them, actually maybe partner up with other colleagues of theirs and really work through uh, a resolution plan and, uh, and have that uh, resolved. So it's you know, really just those bookends where we have the intensive facilitation, potentially uh, uh, the sprints, but um, there's lots of other things there to sit down with product owners and, and work through how they're thinking about their priorities be there when they're studying data about the way the system's used or going and talking to users and stakeholders customers and really understanding how those relationships are how those ways of making um, decisions are uh yeah and this is just an example of a sort of thing i like to uh, teach on advanced certified scrum master courses which i think is a great way to understand how we can be persuasive with making a difference on impediments by studying the not just the underlying root cause and things but also the expressing the business impact and the emotional impact of those persisting so i guess one perspective i'd like to offer a bit of a proposal is a lot of the things we talk about with the scrum master role i think are really very aligned to progressive management what you see in some of the 
most on trend books in management and leadership circles these days. This is just a grab bag of buzzwords, I guess, to do with that. But, uh, you know, really, if you think about it, it's like a blueprint for, for what that might be if you had a lateral organization with distributed cross functional teams that are operating like small mini companies within the company and really trying to emphasize agility. Um, partly putting this up as one of many of the inspiring examples of a servant leader, uh, someone who is really there for others. And I think if you take that to heart and find satisfaction in seeing others do better and thrive and, and over time become more likely to be servant leaders themselves. And I think this is a hugely rewarding role just intrinsically. You don't need to be a hero. It's a post heroic style of leadership where uh, in some cases, and some of the things I'm most proud of as a scrum master, I think the, the people involved, the team would say that they did it themselves. Uh, they may not have even known the subtle things I did in the background to socialize an issue or, or start to build awareness and bring transparency to si the situation that they then took on and actually did something with. So yeah, I think one of the challenges and it's also an exciting opportunity is that the Scrum Master role remains widely misunderstood. I think it's one of these things that's been put in a box of just facilitating a team and running some ceremonies that really are Scrum events. And uh, really, it could be much, much more than that. And it originally was, and I've experienced um, yeah, something that's a, a lot more impactful than that. So it's on us to educate people about what this role is, right? If, if the scrum masters themselves can't explain it, then who can? And along those lines too, if you're expecting to actually lead people's learning about new skills and leveling up and all this sort of thing, well, as a leader, you go first. It's our responsibility to advance our own development. If we can't do that, well, how can we expect that of other people that we might be wanting to encourage that and inspire that with? So I'm trying to offer something to help with that. And uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of certified Scrum Master training over the years, but I think where it really takes off in terms of skills is really the, the advanced certified Scrum Master. Uh, that's where we say you already understand Scrum. Now, what about how you actually have a toolkit of, of skills and not just going really deep with one like professional coaching, but actually have a, have a broad toolkit that you can actually pick the right tool for the job. So that's serving the, the Scrum team, but what about the broader organization? Uh, for that, the CSP is a, is a great offering. Uh, the systems thinking, lean principles, the, the assignments we do on coaching agreements and mentoring and, and organizational interventions, I think are, are really quite powerful things. I've been really impressed at what people have come up with in, in organizations trying these tools and, and doing it for real. Yeah, so yeah, here's just a few of the things that I think are really relevant. I think that the way that Path to CSP program was designed at the Scrum Alliance, I think is a really neat example of the breadth of what contemporary Scrum Masters kind of need in their toolkit. And a lot of the things that far too many people have done part of, but not really been exposed to the, the whole piece and perhaps uh, really invested in their professional development towards having the tools they need to, to rise to the challenges. So that was it. I hope that was okay. Um, thank you. Any questions? So uh, before we uh, transition into questions, um, so uh, everybody, can I, can I invite you to turn your cameras on if you haven't already and just a round of applause to, uh, for Rowan. Thank you for, uh, the, the, for sharing your wisdom and the presentation. Swapping on the other side from facilitator to uh, presenter. Um, thank you. One note, Rowan. Um, we've lost um, Alison. Could you admit her back into the room? Uh, just also conscious of the time as well. Uh, we're about 10 to 7 right now. Uh, I guess uh, uh, while we admit Alison back in, uh, are there any questions uh, is, uh, that are burning that you'd like to ask Rowan? Apologies, Alison. I didn't realize uh, you can let them in. <laughs> Sorry about that, Rowan. <laughs> My power went out and I, was, I couldn't get back in. But that's okay. I'll have to watch the YouTube video of your presentation. <laughs> 
So thoughts, I know it's getting late, but any questions or thoughts? Uh, for else I know myself. Or just a discussion. Very impressed with your coordination going in the mirror. Yeah, I, I didn't practice that beforehand, obviously. <laughs> I'm gonna have to. Yeah, that was very confusing. I've got to be like a weatherman or woman. Yeah. <clears throat> so it seems like a lot of stuff they don't tell you in Scrum Master School. So I found it really helpful. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah, there's a lot of things I think aren't particularly obvious in, in even the training, but also the books and things. It's a lot of things I've picked up over the years, I guess, at conferences overseas and people I know. Yeah. There's a few good articles on those stances, though. If you do want to look them up, there's eight stances that are that have been published about quite a bit. You probably heard a lot about some of them. Um, but yeah, it's good, it's good to have a reminder though. Like it's, I, I've come across them and then done other stuff, and then I, I really, yeah, it's a good refresher to go back and uh, actually uh, practice it. Have we got to find any other mentions in the Bible? God knows, hey, Regis, hey, two of them, not where I wonder where they went. Regis still found a way to work. <laughs> Are um, there any other thoughts or questions? I got a question, Roland. Really, really, uh, really enjoy the presentation. And especially, I think you explained some uh, really um, important concept in a really um, simple to, to understood way. Um, I, I have, I just want to double click on one of the slides you're talking about explaining changes to other part of the organization using emotional, uh, um, um, uh, for example, talking about costs and talking about impact. Um, what I have experienced is um, when I, working in a particular segment or a team which requires a particular transformation to Agile or Scrum, um, but might not be the same for some other cross-functional team. They might not be needing going to that same transition. So when we go to them to try to sell the transition, try to sell the value, I find some have been challenging in that, in that case. So what are your tricks and tips uh, when you actually not having a full organization transition, but just really one segment? or a team transition, but you need to bring the whole organization to support you to make that successful? Yeah, great question. A uh, couple of quick things. You know, one is I think always going to people who've got the authority in the status quo organization to get some level of alignment or not alignment about what do we want, right? If, if we're trying to do something that's actually not aligned to what the people with the existing power in the organization actually want. Uh, and I've been in that situation, right? It's this constant uphill. It's, it's you know, trying to swim up a, up a fast moving river uh, in the wrong direction. So that's one thing. Another thing, you know, I think is it's underutilized in a lot of agile adoptions is the idea of, of getting a volunteers who are enthusiastic about a new way of working you know, together as a pilot and, and kind of using that to, have an exemplar for the rest of the organization, but also the idea of having a, a, uh, a temporary uh, parallel organization where you actually get the, the mandate to be able to set it up in a way that's not restricted to the existing systems and some of the existing kind of things as organizational gravity essentially. And that would tend to be not just the scrum team, but perhaps some other key uh, elements are around a, a team and that might include some some management as well uh, to really experiment with how would that look as a as a new thing with a new culture uh, a couple of thoughts I don't know if that's helping thank you very helpful okay. uh, we had uh, Henry with his uh, hand up oh, hi I've just had a question for Alison um, it was just about the comment Aram was just talking about the lack of scrum masters in um, in her organization. I'm and I was just wondering, is there also an issue with um, product owners as well, like having decent product owners and them knowing their role and being able to get them to do that role yeah. effectively? And and how much did the scrum master have to, I guess, compensate for that? Was there a lot of um, extra work on the scrum master part? Because um, I remember seeing in Rowan's um, graph too around how much work um, the Scrum Master should be doing. I can't remember how much was supposed to be spent on that product owner and product management side helping with that. Did you find that yeah. was a big thing? 
Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Um, so for us, it was more the Scrum Master, uh, struggling with Scrum Masters rather than product owners. But where we had the challenge with the product owners is transitioning them typically from a senior business analyst, for example, into a product owner role. So it wasn't, I think some of them thought at the start it was just a change in title and they were doing the same thing, but we had to really train them on a different way of thinking. Um, so, you know, so it was the training and bringing them up to speed and, and um, encouraging them to work in a particular way and their new responsibilities. So I talked before about roles and responsibilities. So we had to kind of, I know we all try to be agile and, um, you know, people can jump into different roles, that type of thing, but we had to kind of put some structure around it at the start. Um, otherwise, they just got completely lost. Um, and then sometimes we would have enough product owners, not enough scrum masters or a scrum master and, and not a solid product owner. So we had to really, before we kind of launched into a, a project, uh, ideally we would try to work out the dynamics. So we, if we had a, a lot of our scrum masters are professional scrum masters. They're not, they can't fill in for a product owner because they don't have that, that systems experience or subject matter expertise. So, um, but we were able to have our product owner stand in as a scrum master um, in, in some cases. So it worked that way, but not the, not the other way. Yeah. Okay. I've heard about there being some sort of conflict of interest where you have scrum masters and product owners in the same role. And I think some agile coaches mention that as a big no, no, is that, is that sometimes not actually work? So is, is it, sorry, did you say um, having a scrum master and a, and a project manager? A uh, product owner and the scrum master oh. all being the same. I've, I've heard some agile coaches express that as a big no, no, because it's a bit, there's a bit of a conflict of interest in those roles. If you have them do the same thing. So that wasn't yeah. an issue when you were doing that. Well, um, it was more about, where we where we struggled was when we had a new team that had just been put together uh, and they were early in their agile understanding and not having a scrum master there was really difficult so they got into some really bad habits and I, I don't think we're unique in that I think that's what a lot of people um, have experienced from from chatting to others um, so we tried not to we tried to have a scrum master for the critical projects and also for those where um, that were new in understanding about what's going on. I, I, I would often um, step in as a scrum master for the first six weeks or something until we could actually have someone transition in as a scrum master. But in terms of the conflict, um, sometimes you just got to do what you got to do to get the job done. So we really didn't have a choice. It was either someone stands in as a pseudo scrum master or we have no scrum master at all, which uh, on some, depending on the type of work we do, is, was a bit problematic. So... We had to take it on a case by case basis, really. Yeah, cool. Thanks. It sounds similar to the sure. experience too. Where some of the mm. stuff that you read in a textbook about how you should do things yeah. um, doesn't seem to work in reality. Reality is, different. Yeah. <laughs> reality is very different. Yeah, we always try to, we, we actually always try to do that, but um, it just sometimes we, we couldn't wait any longer. We had to get started with our work. So we, we all, that's why we trained everyone in our company in our product delivery group as a scrum master. So they had to have that training if they were going to step in, if we couldn't get a, a, a professional scrum master in, that, that's all their job was. So we used to try to get people to fill in, um, but they had to have had that training. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. So we've got uh, our pad with his uh, hand up. Um, just just looking at time about seven o'clock. So do you think we can squeeze one more question in? Or oh, thought, our pad. Yeah, know. okay. Just quickly, uh, it's both for Rowan and uh, Alison, I guess. Uh, my experience is um, you know, I'm working with organizations um, that uh, internally they are pretty good in, in uh, adopting Agile and uh, they are very keen to do that, very lean and all that. But they are obviously working with vendors. So um, delivering uh, quite interesting and complex projects. So uh, the challenge is that uh, not, uh, not all vendors uh, are really open to that sort of collaborative agile environment. So what is your experience in bringing a vendor uh, you know, along the journey and making sure that uh, they are aligning with you, uh, you know, and delivering uh, in, in smaller batches incrementally uh, and so forth. So that would be... <laughs> Interesting insight. Rowan, do you want to 
give your input. I've got a couple of comments. Okay, uh, maybe just to quickly share an experience that really blew me away on that score. Uh, when I was involved in a, a big adoption uh, of Scrum, it, a multinational, I guess, was our client uh, based in the UK, but they had five vendors, uh, some in India, some in Eastern Europe. And basically the, the way that was set up in a, in a really nice way, I think, was probably using the opportunity in early stages of negotiation for, with vendors that if you're going to work with us, this is the way we're going to work. <laughs> and not just vagaries about agile, but uh, this is specifically what we expect of you in terms of showing up to the late days of the, sp the sprint face to face with the representatives in, in London, uh, having people on the line um, doing the sort of big room planning at, at, at for uh, sprint planning, uh, a whole lot of things which are respected in terms of you know, being able to do continuously integrate using the existing same systems that everyone else uses, et cetera, across the board. So it's going to be synchronous. It's going to be like there were just other teams as part of the whole and not a separate kind of group that hands off at different cadences to how we're sprinting. And it worked amazingly well. That was uh, one of the things I, I think was a big secret of their success was just how aligned the vendors were to this way of working because they were told this is a must. If you're going to work with us, this is the way we're operating and, and you must fit into that. You're great, thanks. Also, we are thinking about uh, you know the forming a hybrid team where we have basically the vendor uh, people working together with the uh, uh, company people in one team instead of having two separate teams and you know dealing with handovers and all that stuff so that might help uh, you know uh, improving that collaboration and uh, adopting each other's uh, you know uh, ways of working and helping out each other more quickly so yeah it's something uh, that we're experimenting you're proposing yeah it'd be very interesting to hear about that yeah yeah yes Alison, Alison, you had something to add? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to what Rowan was saying. Um, it, 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 we found that as well. So if we had to bring in a vendor to work with us, to partner with us on some development, you, you, it's really difficult to have two different ways of working. So we had to yeah. stipulate to them, whether it was the whole, the whole, the, all the organisation coming on board with us or a couple of their people, we had to work one way. Um, and so what we would do is we would run them through sort of some high level training if um, they had no idea about Agile and were new to it. Um, so we would do some training with them, but that was a condition of us partnering with them. Um, otherwise it just wouldn't work. Um, the other thing we kind of did too is sometimes if we had to ramp people up really quickly and we, we got them from another organization, um, we would have our internal guys do all the, I guess the, um, the, Jira tools, all the you know, updating stories and doing all of that, rather than having to get them the license, having to get them to actually go into the system if they only had a small piece of work to do. So, um, so we would just kind of we would just work it out as we go, basically. Um, but it would always we'd always have to stick to the to the to agile way of working. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Well, it looks like we've been at it for an hour and a half. So from the still with us, has earned their 1.5 SEUs, I think. So. <laughs> totally. Yeah. And it was very useful. Thank you very much for organizing it and uh, yeah, great insight. And just uh, understanding your experience. Yeah, it's extremely good. Cheers. And thanks so much, Alison. Yeah, it it's been a tricky yeah i've done this once before and found it also tricky you just i like to invite the csp graduates certified scrum professional graduates to kind of do these meetups and oh. allison put a hand up and we've had a couple of others who couldn't make it but yeah thank you so much for doing this yeah. it's been wonderful my pleasure it was fun thank you for the opportunity thanks everyone thanks for joining us thanks derek thanks for helping out with those questions thank you. Uh, we don't have anything organized for next month but um,